and welcome back, my chin-wagging compatriots. I am Paul Giamatti. I am Stephen Asma. Welcome to the Chinwag. Indeed. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. A vortex of creativity. Is that what it is? Is yes, it a is it, it is. a is it a maelstrom of mental <laughs> machinations, Steve? <laughs> you trumped me. <laughs> oh my I? lord. Yes. Oh, it's a veritable <laughs> whirlpool of whimsy and <laughs> wonder. <laughs> Boy. Oh, that, that, that it, it really kind of is. I mean, for us, at maelstrom least, I mean, for sure. Yeah, yeah maelstrom. yes, it's a maelstrom. <laughs> it's a it's a complete, complete uh, whirly gig. Uh, we 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 had so many questions about the majestic octopus uh, that we didn't get to everything on our no, chinwag. An amazing with, uh, animal, Peter what Godfrey kind of, Smith. Yeah, it's like so, an alien on Earth. It's incredible. it really is super super intelligent. So here's the rest of our chat with this uh, fine philosopher, Peter Godfrey Smith, author of Other Minds, The Octopus, The Sea, and The Deep Origins of Consciousness. This is, of course, your bonus wag. You talk in the book about the latecomer view, which is that consciousness comes out at the end of this evolutionary process, and we have it, and maybe like dolphins and primates have it, Versus this, what you're calling the transformative view, which is that there's sort of consciousness in some form really early on and that it's getting sort of built up. But then, you know, I, and I may be mischaracterizing Paul, but Paul is one of the <laughs> last, he's one of the last idealists. And he th he's thinking more like sort of Blake and Goethe and Emerson. He thinks mind <laughs> is first. Look at the company I just gave you, man. It's amazing. I know. And, You're really, and wow. And body, Jeez. You know, the body, I'm like Goethe, wow. <laughs> okay. The bodies come afterwards. I know this is obviously not a scientific view. But, but people are also, alternatively to an idealism view, people are talking about panpsychism, that maybe consciousness is there in every bit of matter. In every bit and, of matter. Yeah, uh -huh. in every bit of uh -huh. matter. I'm just wondering, like, what are your responses to this? These options are interesting. Starting with panpsychism, uh, uh, in that case, I do see it as a position that people find themselves forced to by the apparent impossibility of explaining how you could get experience coming out of something that was other than itself you know how could you start with atoms and non-experiencing matter and put it together in a certain way and experience makes, or consciousness uh, appears yeah. you know? uh -huh. people look at that problem and they think there's just no way to solve that problem so if we think that matter is real and not to be you know, explained away in terms of mind, and we think that mind is real, and we've just decided that we, it can't be explained away, you know, right. reduced to the material, then everything must have a bit of both and must have always had it from the start. So it's a, I do see it as a position of kind of last resort, a position you're pushed to by <laughs> certain kinds of <laughs> yeah. impo impossibility of explanation. Yeah. Yeah. And if we could explain how... In animal life, with nervous systems, with the kind of things that animals do, you can get consciousness arising from its absence, you know, from something, from a situation where it really wasn't there, then there's certainly no need to be a panpsychist because we've we've overcome what looked like that, in, that very difficult problem. Mm. And there's just no reason to believe it. I mean, a, a grain of sand, unless I'm given a really good argument for why there has to be a glimmer of consciousness there. <laughs> it just seems like the way a grain of sand is is just just not the kind of thing that's in the yeah in the ballpark at all. You have to be yeah. pushed there in the case of panpsychism. Yeah. In the case of idealism, well, I actually haven't had a, a conversation with a genuine <laughs> I don't put that on me. On I don't even topics. I'm not even sure what you mean, dude. It's like what do you what do you mean when you say that about me, Steve? I well, mean I'm I an actor. That's, that's all I am. I'm an actor. I don't know anything. But that so was a common I think your view is sort of like what was held very commonly before Darwin, which was <laughs> And you see it in biologists too. They they thought the mind is there first, and nature has been built on the on the structure of God's mind. And our there's mind a kind can of pervasive it. energetic yes. mind that's animating the yeah. universe. And yeah, I suppose that is sort of true. I mean, I think that I 
I think, that, yeah, I've told you this, that I, I considered myself an atheist for a long time until I realized, bear with me, Peter, I believed in ghosts. So I was like, then I was like, well, how can I tell myself a materialist or an atheist? And then I really sort of admitted myself, yeah, you're right, that in my mind, there's a kind of energizing I don't know what you'd call it. There's a kind Structure of to flow things, of energy that's yeah. animating everything at all times. So I suppose, yes, that's true. Does this make me like a caveman? Does this just like... <laughs> you can't get tenure <laughs> at a, at a <laughs> I university. I won't get tenure that's... anywhere. <laughs> but you would have in Germany in the 19th century, you would have <laughs> been, made a big <laughs> professor, you know. Yeah, totally. <laughs> me and Schopenhauer going at yeah, it. And, yeah. yeah. Um, I but guess wait, so, one last yeah. point on this. I'm yeah, sorry, and then yeah, I'll yeah. close no, it off. No. I'll let, leave it alone. But one thing I really like about Paul's view and the sort of, and I, I sh, I'm a Darwinian like you are, Peter, but I do think that the Darwinians have a great way of explaining the causal mechanisms of nature. But, you know, and so everybody's now writing books on determinism, and now Robert Sapolsky has another book on determinism. And But the beauty of... What does that the, mean, Steve? Just to find it, it just means that me. everything you do is not really your free choice. It's just you're a material, you're a meat machine, uh -huh. and it, the neurons fire, and you just like billiard balls hitting each other, shit happens, and uh -huh. the universe is, is kind of this, this giant machine. Uh -huh. And while I think that's exactly what science has to do, um, the, the, the great thing about the romantic, you know, the, the nature philosophers, you know, the, the sort of um, von Humboldts of the world is that their picture of the world was much more like our lived experience. Like uh -huh. you, what, the, what, what philosophers call the phenomenology of experience. Like you walk around, in the, you take a walk in nature and you feel the poetry. This is what it feels like. Of the trees, like. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and it's just sad that that's gone away or it's just been relegated to aesthetics, you know, and so they can't enter into a study of nature anymore. But anyway, I'll leave it alone now. Thank you for indulging me. You begin to, towards the end of that book, start to talk about language and the function of language. And, and you talk a little bit about that because... And inner octop speech. Octopuses don't have a language in theory unless possibly it's this ability to change colors. Is that right? Yeah, I, I don't think they... And I don't think that would count. Uh, um, there's an interesting kind of um, sort of partial or halfway character to what they do. Language does what it does because you've got richness at the sending and the receiving end. You can make a lot of complicated signs, sounds, and the interpreter or the receiver can respond to those subtleties and, and do very complicated things in response. There's complexity at both ends. With cephalopod skin patterns, if we just look at their role within the lives of the animals, there's a huge amount of complexity on the production end, on the yeah. sending end. They make these astounding uh, patterns and color changes. They can change the whole color of their skin in less than a second. And on the receiving end, in as much as they are directed at other members of their own species, which they are to some extent, because some of it's involved in mating and territorial disputes and things like that, it looks like it's much, much simpler on the receiving end. So it's, it's sort of language-like or even more than language-like mm. in its complexity on the sending end. But most of it's just kind of, the complexity is not going anywhere. It's, yeah. it's sort of disappearing. It's wasted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's well, it's, it, yeah, it's un unless one is has a romantic view of nature. In <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here we no, go. And, no, but, but, but I mean, but unless one has some romantic view of it, that it serves some other purpose that we can't fathom, that we, we can't fathom why they collect the, the spikes from the ground and then change in a crazy array of colors because there's some alien sort of communication going on between them and another Octo another octopus that we just can't comprehend, or cuttlefish, or whatever the, the particularly colorful ones are. Or they're just contributing to the big, the big energy field in the particular right. way that they do. Yes. I mean, yes. once you open the door to those kinds of possibilities, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot that could be going on. Some of it could be. I mean, it, you, you sort of suggest that is it is some of it could it possibly be. It's just a, it's just a display of whatever cogitation's going on, that it's sort of it's just following whatever they're doing or 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 perhaps thinking, 
or even they're dreaming sometimes. You talk about one specific octopus that maybe it, that looks like he's asleep because his eyes appear to be sort of closed. So maybe he's dreaming. So it could be that too. The dreaming, the dreaming stuff, this is another area that's firmed up since the book was uh -huh. written. Oh. Uh, I mean, it, dreaming is always going to be very controversial, very hard to work out what's going on. But there are a couple of papers published in the last 12 months that start to make dreamlike states look really? you know, look genuinely possible. Yeah. Wow. There's also been some amazing anecdotal stuff. There was a there's a famous video, Heidi the octopus, <laughs> uh, going through dreamlike states in a, a documentary that my collaborator David Scheel was involved in, uh, where the octopus was living in his house for a certain period of time. And impressionistically, it looks like octopuses go into a kind of a quiet sleep-like state and sometimes mm -hmm. produce all sorts of uh, patterns and colors. That's just impressionistic. And a paper was published, I think, maybe it was this year, actually. Yeah, it was this year, um, that looked inside the brain of the octopuses in sequences of this kind. And the brain activity makes it look like they have uh, two phases of sleep, quiet and active huh. sleep, as huh. people do. You know, we have quiet sleep and, and REM sleep. Which oh, so is there's active. a kind of REM thing going yeah. on. Yeah. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. And during the, uh, the active sleep stages, sometimes you get these intense bouts of, of patterning and color. Right. So do we then infer, okay, it feels like a dream. It feels like a dream to be doing this. Very, you know, I don't think we can say that yeah. yet. Uh, I don't. I think we'll eventually. I don't see why we couldn't eventually have a lot of confidence one way or the other. At the moment, I think it's fair to say it looks very suggestive that there could be dreamlike states in. Octopus. What about dreaming and animals in general, dogs and cats, which are ones that we see, and primates and things. I mean, we're we're pretty sure they dream. I mean, that's. I know, know Darwin do. was interested in in the the the. the um, well, I think in the Descent of Man, there's a section on do animals dream and he's speculating by seeing dogs move when they're yeah. asleep and yeah. but he think he says that that he says the dreaming is sort of like an involuntary form of imagination i mean he doesn't know this for sure but he's just speculating what are your thoughts on that peter i I'd, I'd forgotten that he said that i mean that's as 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 is common for darwin pretty prescient uh it it does look quite a lot like that uh Increasingly so. Someone you you might think of having on the sh show is a guy yeah. called David Pena Guzman. Uh -huh. He's a y young philosopher who's written a book that came out last year. It's called either When Animals Dream or uh -huh. something very close to that. That would oh, be cool. great. Okay, it, cool. it's it's yeah. a really good book. It's it's yeah. it's very good. He goes through the evidence, and he is he is quite convinced that lots of animals dream. Now, he's talking about mammals and birds. He's not talking about octopuses and other invertebrates very much. He has a little bit about the octopuses, but it's most the, the, the cases he wants to really press on are especially mammals, cats, uh -huh. rats, animals like that. And it does, I think, look very likely that, that there's lots and lots of dreaming in those guys. In the rat cases, this is what connects to the Darwin comment. Uh, there's some work that's suggestive on the whole point of this, which is that you know rats have internal maps, maps of their their environment in their brains, and when they're asleep, sometimes you can see from the activity that the the rat is, you know, huh. in its mind traversing a particular path that's through. Awesome. That's, that's really cool. It's map of the world. Uh -huh. And there are some studies suggesting that the rat is trying out novel paths, you know, possible ways of getting somewhere desirable, shortcuts, new ways to get where it wants to go <laughs> wow. with these with these explorations of its internal map while it's asleep. That, I mean, uh, that's amazing work. It, it's, it's incredible. It's right? fascinating. Yeah. One thing I would add to what we we're talking about a moment ago is the distinction between quiet sleep and active sleep this looks like it's all over the place bees huh. flies uh i forgot i think bees might have three phases of sleep really? um flies have a distinction between quiet and active sleep and I, this i find really weird because the common ancestor of you and a fly 
who is the same animal who is a common ancestor of you and an octopus, mm. was this probably a little worm-like guy about maybe sort of 570 million years ago or so, somewhere between 550 and 600 roughly million years ago, living in a time when, you know, being a worm was a very sort of high-end you know, way of... <laughs> you were the shit. If you, 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 you were the guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the deluxe model back, back uh -huh. then. Yeah. And, um, you know, very small, probably a flattened worm. If the common... Act, right, so if, if we have two phases of sleep and sleep itself and a bee or an octopus has two phases of sleep, then either we both invented it separately and the oh. common ancestor didn't have it or maybe the common ancestor had a really, wow. had its own That's, really simple wow. version of this. And I don't know which is a more amazing thing to yeah. think yeah. about, the kind of the double invention or the fact that this worm was, yeah. had its own version of those things. Wow. Oh, wow, that's wild. Chinwag is a production of Treefort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Treefort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardot. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Treefort. Audio production supervision by Matt Dyson. Editing and mixing by Jeff Neal. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Research assistance by Aiden Brooks. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod.